country living is not just about having a bolt hole in the country where you can escape from the stresses and pressures of modern living. Over the next month, I'll try and introduce you to some of this. I've lived in the countryside now all my life. I'm proud to call myself a countryman and I like to pass it on to young and old and especially the young. Come and join us in this adventure. Well, welcome to our little self-help shoot. We've got 1,800 acres here that we run as a small shoot. We don't put huge numbers of birds down. We look after the duck. We don't shoot any ground game. Uh, we've got lots of hares, but we don't shoot them. We do put game crop in, but it's wildlife and bird friendly. You can see a strip, a late crop, going in under that hedge line over there. A big day on this shoot is probably 80 birds. A small day is 30. And it's totally self-help. We all enjoy working our dogs and shooting, and it just suits us. I'm not saying that's the way it should always be, but it's what we want. <sighs> so, how did you? Is there any sign of much using it? Uh, well, the duck's on it. Um, and a few feathers. Oh, uh, they'll start well, to use. Some of the wheat's gone, and the bottom looks harder. Yeah. They'll be using it as much as anything at the moment, Jonathan, yeah. to rest on. And they'll be out stumbling in the evening and then back on here to rest again. Well, we're at the duck pond at the moment. One of the big ones. You can see we've got a beautiful dean up through here, which runs for about probably three quarters of a mile on us. Um, very natural, untouched, untouched for years. A dean really is a natural valley formed by a burn or a stream, if you want to call it that. It's usually very wet in the bottom. And because and with steep sides, one of which will always hopefully face south, so you've got a warm side and a colder side, it's a wonderful place for a myriad of wildlife. Butterflies, moths, beetles, insects. And that's all part of the natural food chain for many, many things. We're very lucky to have something that's unspoilt and untouched in this part of the country. I'm very fond of it and love being down here, as long as my poor old legs will allow me to get down here. We feed the ducks here, and we don't shoot them hard. We rely on this more as a resting pond for them. But uh, it means work. Jonathan, who's a member of the syndicate, this is his, this is one of his jobs. When you do it for yourself, there are many, but it's easier if you share them. I think there's still some mallards somewhere up the top there, so they haven't even got off. Um, well, look at this. This is a real honey hole for wildlife. There is a little pond in there, a flight pond, which we're gonna feed now. It'll be well weeded up, but by the time the ducks are using it a lot, it will gradually clear. And the ducks will deal with the weed, and then the grain. This is a flight pond where the ducks flight in in the evening and a few times a year we take our share of the crop. I like roast duck I have to admit and this is the best way to gather it. It's nice if you can get it in the, in the water mainly because that which stays on the bank is a bit of encouragement to rats. That's it. For the next month, we'll feed this pond regular and gradually it will clear. And then of course we keep feeding it. It's most important to feed it when the duck really need it, which is later on in the year. But as long as when they come in for a wash and brush up, they find it, a few will start staying a little bit longer. And that's how you kick a flight pond off rather proud to be able to show you our latest game crop. It went in for last year. It wasn't very big last year, but look at it now. And look at the feed that's in it for everything, not just pheasants. 
this last year was full of every conceivable wild bird that was resident here and it's going to be just the same this year probably even greater thanks to the farmer he's put it in properly he's fed it properly and we've got a really good game crop this is the sort of thing that happens on shoots that people just don't realize more and more do but everybody doesn't that food there quinoa perfect for small birds it's the sort of thing you'd expect to see hanging up in a canary cage. So that tells you what sort of bird eats that. Any small finch. This is triticale, an old fashioned form of grain, which has, it stays over the winter. So there's always grain in there for small birds and for pheasants, of course. It wouldn't be here if it wasn't for pheasants. But we're proud of it, and justly so. I'm only going to walk by it so you can see the height. And now, while you wait there, if I may, I, I've, I've got a feeder to check at the bottom of this, so I'll just drive away. Here's our fencer unit. It delivers through the wire a maximum of six to seven thousand volts just to give you an idea interesting enough doesn't affect the pheasants it's reading five thousand which is okay that's just enough to put anything off it won't certainly won't kill anything but it might put it off coming back I was stood up there working the other day and forgot it was on and put my leg on it and it, the ground was wet and I certainly wouldn't say it was uh, enjoyable. When I disturb them like this I always like to throw a little bit of food about then they associate me with food. But as you can see, they're nice and quiet, happy, content. This is how I like to see them. The drinkers here are on two lines. One line goes down here, the other line round right there, two separate tanks. So heaven forbid, if I get a problem in one tank, there's still water inside the pen and out. We're very lucky in this pen, there's plenty of cover. And it is a very big pen. This pen is probably well, it's just about the size of a football pitch. That's the easy way for people to sort of realise. My rather boring whistle is very important. It, it helps them associate me with safety, not danger. And food. It settles them, as you see. They're just a little bit wondering what the camera is, but you can see they're not bothered by me. Well, it looks like I, tomorrow morning, my main job will be to fill up about four more of those hoppers that have got quite light. But now I shall walk all the way around, make sure nothing's happened, make sure the fence is okay, and there can't be any problem with the wire. We've just tested it. This is a ritual, really, to put my mind at rest before I go home. When I get to each of these pop holes, which allows pheasants back in, but they can't get out, I always throw just a bit of corn or feed like that, just beyond the pop hole. So tomorrow morning, the birds that fly off roost and land out here, when they want to go back in, as soon as they're inside, they realise they've got to feed. 
in about another week, this will be opened up. These corners are made so that you can just unscrew them, open up, and then they can come and go and gradually get used to being totally in the world. Other than the fact that there are in fact four, can be five drives within this dean, which stretches away that way, that way, and indeed down there for about a quarter of a mile. There are two other drives which this pen sends birds to. There's a drive there, which you can see it's laid out, I guess, for pheasants. And the drive there on the top of the hill. We're just waiting for this drive to start, and I've got Domino with me here, who's not really ready to do a lot of practical stuff on a day's picking up like this, but he's here to hear the shot, to experience the day, and he can't really go wrong because he's on the lead. And people often ask us, when is the right time to take my young dog on its first shoot? Well, it's difficult to answer because all dogs progress at different stages, but actually you're safe to take them as soon as you like, as long as they stay on the lead, because he's just with me today, like he's sat on the lead, he's not going to get into any mischief, not do anything wrong, but he's going to hear the shots, see the guns, see the other dogs, learn to sit hopefully still off the other dogs here, and he's going to learn much more here today than he would do if he was at home. A bit of open woodland like this is really good fun because the guns are hidden by a screen of trees over there, but in here it's nice and open and we're getting a variety of birds either dipping and flying through that are too low for them to shoot at, or some really good birds over the top of the trees that are kind of crashing around us. And as a picker up, this sort of drive is quite exciting for me. I've marked a, a dead pheasant pretty much straight in front of me there, which I think will be useful for the young dog Domino here when the drive's over. So I've kind of got that earmarked for him unless there's a better opportunity that presents itself. And there's, there's still a couple more in that bit there. Sit up. Dexter. Sit up. I wouldn't, wouldn't normally have sent him for that because the drive's going on because it's got its head up. And it had only ran a short distance, but it could have ran more then. Dexter, sit up. And you see, when he came back in and he had the um, confusion with where I was uh, and he kind of went round me a little bit, the wing was over his eyes there, so he couldn't see exactly where I was. But if the bird's going to run like that, it's a good idea to get a dog onto it quickly and get it picked, otherwise it can potentially be lost, even if the drive's in full swing. Yeah. See there. Lost. Good girl. Sit up, Ty, sit up. Good girl. Good girl. Leave it, good girl. Leave it. Leave it. Good girl. Good girl. Tulsa. Sit up. Sit up. Good girl. Good girl, Tulsa. Tulsa. Tie, sit up. Tulsa. Come on, Tulsa. 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 
Tulsa, Tulsa, Tulsa. Good girl. Leave it. Good girl. Ty, sit up. Sit up. And even when we're out picking up, we don't leave everything to chance, even when they're supposedly fully trained dog. If something tempting comes over and is shot and lands quite near us, straight away under my breath I'm just saying sit up like that, just to remind them. And hopefully nothing more than that's needed, but just a little reminder like that reminds them that even under the pressure of a shooting day, same rules apply as at home in training. Let's see if we can pick a few of these birds. Okay, that's the drive just finished. There's a few pheasants dropped along this wood. Stop. Tie. Good girl, Ty. 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 Good girl. Good girl. Good girl. Sit up. Sit up. Sit up. Domino. Sit up. Sit up. Sit up. Good boy. Good boy. Good boy. Here comes our softie. Just made a really nice job of that. Good boy, Domino. 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 Good boy. Good boy. So that's perfect for him. Sit up. Sit up. Sit up, guys. He'd marked that pheasant down and I made him wait till the end of the drive till he went it till he went to pick it, but he'd obviously marked it nicely himself, made a lovely straight line for that and a lovely confident delivery. You see he's growing in confidence all the time. I mean through sit up through his sit up training when he was a youngster, he can do everything. He's got plenty of ability, he's just got a little mental thing with pressure and if he has a little block like that, but it's surprising a few days shooting and a few nice retrieves like that, how that kind of lifts and he'll Really realise what life's about now, won't you, Domino? Good boy. Uh, Viva. Get on. Good girl, come on, good girl, come on Viva, good girl, good girl, good girl, Viva here, yeah. Viva, good girl, sit up, leave it, leave it, leave it, good girl, sit up, good girl, sit up, sit up, sit up, Dexter, come here, Dexter, come here, Dexter, sit up, sit up, Dexter, sit up, sit up, good boy. Good boy, good lad. Sit up, good dog, sit up. Sit up. Good dog, sit up. Okay, that's the birds that I've marked picked there. So we're going to take the group now and do a bit of sweeping up, make sure that nothing's uh, been left that we um, that we either didn't see or you know something prick that might have tucked in. We're going to have a good sweep of the area. Again, setting them off one at a time. Holter. Tie. Domino. Viva. Dexter. Dexter. Good luck. Go oh, tie. Good girl, tie. Domino. Good boy. Tie. 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 Good girl. Domino. Come on, Domino. Good boy, Domino. Good boy. Good boy. Good boy, leave it. Good boy. See, that's a good sign. Domino had that hen drive, uh, hen just at the end of the drive, which we'd marked. But just during sweeping up then, that's the first cock pheasant, first pheasant of any description that he's picked sweeping up. I've given him a few mark retrieves, which he's doing quite nicely, but he's just found one of his own accord there. Because usually when they're youngsters, it takes a little bit of time before they'll do that because they just follow the older dogs around when they first go picking up. But he's just located that nicely on his own and brought it back. Good boy. And Salsa's got another one here. Good girl, Salsa. Good girl. Good girl, Salsa. 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 That tie, leave it, salsa. Good girl, good girl. Sit up, good girl. See, it's amazing how they tuck in. It's always worth sweeping properly. See, because that was still alive then. It just tucked into that clump of rushes while I was too busy admiring Domino to notice what salsa was up to. But especially if they've got a bit of life in them, they can tuck in very easily. So it's definitely worth having a thorough sweep through behind the guns after each drive when possible. Sit up, tie. Salsa. I'm just waiting till young Domino looks at me. Domino. Viva. Good boy. Dexter. 
Come on, get on, on you go, lost. Lost, good dog. Lost then, lost, on you go. Good dog. Good boy, lost on, lost. Come on, get on, on you go. On you go. Come on, get on, on you go, lost, lost, lost. Dexter, come on, Dexter, Dexter, Dexter. Off you go, oh, let me go. Off, good dog. Dexter. De Dexter, off, go off, Dexter. Go on, Dexter. Right, here I'm fishing with a standard check nymph setup. Three flies. Because we're fishing in shallower water, I'm fishing with the heaviest fly in the centre. This will keep all three flies close to the bottom, which is where I want to be fishing. What I do, the first thing I do is degrease my leader before I enter the water. So I just degrease it. This is full as earth, glycerine, and washing up liquid that's been put onto a pad. So I can just degrease it. It takes the shine off the line and also helps it uh, sink straight away. The only difference with this rig that I'm using to a standard check nymph is that second indicator. This is when I'm fishing very, very close in, when I'm starting to fish into the water, or when I've just cast in, I watch that for any takes as the flies are falling through the water. Sometimes the grayling will take just as the flies falling down through the water. So I can spot that before my leader gets chance to set up. One is on the end of the fly line, and the other one is built into the system which is bicoloured mono of the same diameter as the leader system and they're about five feet apart. Another thing you must always do when entering the river is to be aware of stealth. There'll be fish lying just in here so you don't want to go in and crash into the river sending those fish alarmed taking the other fish with them. So what I want to do, I have a chance of catching those fish, but what I don't want to do is spook them and take all the fish with them across the river. So stealth is the main thing. So when you're entering the water, use your stick to enter the water so you're not slipping and sliding and sending bow waves across the top of this still water. It's always Put your stick in and wade to the stick. Now remember what I said about these fish that could be lying at the end of my rod tip. So I don't extend any line out yet. I just cast and swim those bugs through that water. Extending another six inch and you can see, can you see that? indicator just above the water so I haven't really got my leader extended fully yet and I'm fishing inside you can just see the, in, the second indicator just above the water your stick goes out and we wade to the stick you'll notice that around my body I'm not sending bow waves to alarm the fish extending my line all again and we're, we're fishing You'll see how the bicoloured indicator just on the tip of the water. So I'm just watching the, the first indicator at this moment because we're close in and we're fishing shallow. So once again, I'm watching that second indicator. And because I've got my heaviest fly on the middle dropper, I'm fishing all three nymphs down at the bottom. You do sacrifice sensitivity for strikes on the point fly, but at least all three flies are in the fishing zone. This method is not only good for catching large grayling, 
it's also very sensitive and you can catch a lot of small ones as well. This time of the year, grayling seem to be sat on the bottom waiting for food to come down. And not, they will come through the water column to take a, a fish higher up in the water, but they do like it down at the bottom. So now I fish my way out to the end of this current. I'm going to start making my way now slowly upstream. So all the time I take a step upstream and then I fan round covering as much water as I possibly can. Right. With this method and having all the three flies along the bottom, I can feel the flies bumping along the bottom, trundling across. And if you look how I have my, how I hold my line, I have it through my two front fingers, you'll see that I hold the fly line. Now what I'm doing here is feeling. So not only am I watching the two indicators, I'm also feeling for takes. You can feel the fly line, the flies bumping along the bottom and that transmits to my fingers via the fly line. So now we're into deeper water. I'm now watching the indicator at the end of my fly line because the bicolored mono is disappearing under the water. So now I have the second indicator to watch. When you see this method of casting described as a cast, with these three heavy bugs on such a short line, it's not really a cast. It's more of a controlled flick. So what I do, I just flick the flies around. So to cast them, I let them go taut below me and use them like a flick and I just flick. So it's just a flick against the weight of the flies. So they go below me, flick. So you just lift them off and flick them out. And we're in. Now that take was ever so subtle. The fly line hardly moved, but I felt it. fish. This fish has took my middle dropper, that's the one that's anchored on the bottom. So if I catch a few fish and I predominantly to start taking them on the bottom fly, that means they're, they're wedged right on the bottom. What I'm going to use here is a catch and release tool. 
it's uh, a modern fly fisherman's disgorger. It just goes down, over the fly, and out. That way, I don't have to touch the fish, I don't take any scales, I don't burn it, I don't put it in my net, I just let it go, it hasn't been touched.